very good story from uh, potentially a few weeks um, in terms of our local peaks. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the negotiations that are ongoing um, with the European Union, um, with the DUP in Northern Ireland, with the people of Northern Ireland and within the Conservative Party. That's a lot of players, a lot of chess pieces going on at the moment. But tonight we're going to focus on Kurdistan and we're going to focus on a very specific issue and that's about the issue of unemployment in Kurdistan. I'm really excited about this topic, uh, having worked for six or seven years um, launching and facilitating Kurdish House London. We have many of our members who are starting businesses across the Kurdish regions and whilst I'm not an expert, members of Kurdish House London are experts. So I'm fascinated to hear what solutions there might be uh, what panelists bring tonight. So please listen up and uh, do make notes. You are allowed to use your phones to write questions, that's okay. Um, just not to take calls or anything. So without further ado, I am going to start probably just with a general introduction. I'm looking at the room and I don't think there's anyone here who doesn't know that there are 40 to 50 million people who are separated by artificial borders that standing here as a British person, I feel partly responsible for that separation that was caused and the pain that has been caused by those borders. So whilst I said we're talking specifically about southern region, about Kurdistan, about Bakur tonight mainly, I think it's okay if we you know, think about things in the broader, wider Kurdish region perspective. Um, because it's a shared nation and we're just the realities at the moment. So a significant part of the marginalization, the uh, even persecution that has been uh, undergone in the Kurdish region, part of that is a lack of educational possibilities. So if you're not given good educational possibilities, uh, that clearly doesn't really help with employment possibilities. So whilst in Kurdish House London, we always help young Kurdish people to see if they want to have an academic career, if they want to do a degree, if they want to do an apprenticeship, it doesn't mean you have to do a degree. But on the other hand, if you're denied doing a degree because you want to do one, as one of our members you know, kept being stopped from doing a degree, it took him 17 years to do his degree as a very, very smart Kurdish person who is a world leader in artificial intelligence and geolocation. So due to that kind of suppression, that kind of slowness on his education, he's kind of 40, 50 years behind, and yet he's still a global leader. So I do want to make that first point about the holding back in the Kurdish regions in Bakur, how slow education has been for everyone and how in the greater region that really does make a difference for employment possibilities. So we do have some statistics just to put on the table today. I think it's quite difficult statistics, so we're not going to argue about them because as you know in the region in Bakur it's very hard to get uh, good statistics, good surveys. Um, but we did hear um, in terms of the figure that I have is that out of the 1.5 million people who are working mm -hmm. in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, around 81% are employed in the public sector. So when we're talking about jobs, that is still the job of people, is to work in the government uh, sector. Another statistic we have about the 15 to 24 year olds, so that's a really big group that we work with here in London as well. They're the largest group struggling to find employment with over one in five of them unemployed. The panelists just checking beforehand, we think that is a real underestimate that one in five are unemployed. Um, and I think there'll be other things that the audience need to work to read around that. So again, not to debate that tonight, but it is an issue. And I think some panelists may bring some light on that topic as well. So we really want to hear, you know, literally first-hand experience. Um, to say our panelists, we um, we do have quite a lot of expertise on it, and they're only going to be given ten minutes each. 
So it does mean we then have more time for questions and answers at the end. And I actually expect that with the audience participation, we'll go deeper into some of the topics that the panelists have raised. Because of the change in location, we haven't had time to check like what the overlap is, what the, the, how it comes together, what the panelists are going to say. I would have liked to have done that, so I apologize to you as an audience that we haven't had the time to do that. So please help us weave the story, the thread together uh, around unemployment in post one and the solutions to the, the very clear problem that there is. Uh, and yeah, I really invite your participation in a, in a positive sense of thinking. So I'm going to start on my right here um, with Beto Ahmed. He was born in Wolverhampton. I think I was brought up in Birmingham. That's um, local to me. Um, but he's actually born in Kamani. Um, he himself is a business owner, and he's got lots of experience, which I'm looking forward to hearing about after the session tonight. Lots of different sectors, uh, including being a political commentator. He's been a vocal activist um, of the pro kurdish political party, Al Haymani, HPD. He's hosted and engaged with key political activists on Kurdistan, but he's also had a lot of sit-down discussions in Wolverhampton and Birmingham, which I'm delighted to hear about. So I'm going to campaign successfully, and you'll love this one, and I hope you've taken advantage of it, that there's a Kurdish GCSE in Britain. So if you didn't know that, Please tell your friends and relatives there is a Kurdish GCSE. You might as well have another A for A because it's not going to hurt. I'm talking about getting a job. So that is thanks in, in great part um, to our wonderful uh, panelist, Akram. So thank you very much for your contribution. Yes. Sorry, uh, I, I campaigned to get, to get it as a GCSE. It has not been successful as of yet. Oh, in, 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 oh my in, in, goodness. In, 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 I think these notes are not quite clear enough. Then. Thank you. But also I'm just active in um, holding events with the Kurdish Clerisy Organization, and you may find them at demonstrations as well. So I am thinking of doing something radically different. I'm not going to introduce all the panelists. We're actually going to focus on each panelist uh, at a time. So now you know, um, you know much more, even if it wasn't quite up to date, about Bako. Um, I would invite you to have your 10 minutes. So we're on the half hour, so um, really welcome to what you have to bring to this discussion. Thank, thank you. you. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, I wanted to bring a different perspective to this event. There's a couple of points I have here that I'd like to discuss with all of you tonight. The first is with the general consensus that I have spoke to many people back home, business owners, young people, I try to gather as much information as I can. And one thing that I gathered clearly is the sort of key difference between the regions of Ebi and Suleimani. In Ebi, the majority of the people said, oh yeah, we get to work, it's, it's all right. Whereas in Suleimani, that was not the case. Um, I spoke with a family friend and he owns kiosks in different Kurdistan. He's known Majdi Mall and his family more around the country. And uh, he said he put out a CV at the same time uh, for a worker in, in one of his kiosks in Hoda and in Erbil, sorry, and a, one for Slemani. He said he had received about 100 CVs for both. The key difference though here was that the ones in Erbil all said, ah, oh, so what's the times? Because I wanted to suit around my other job, he said out of the hundred, only about two or three of those people that actually applied for the job were unemployed. The rest wanted it as a second job to supplement their, their income. Whereas the ones in Slemani were all saying, when can we start? When is our start date? He said that there were people with law degrees, engineering degrees, lining up to work in a kiosk because they can find work at work elsewhere, which I found fascinating. So I started to think about why these differences are, and having travelled back to Kurdistan uh, this past summer, I realised that one key difference between Hole and Slemani, every and Slemani, is the infrastructure, and by that I mean the roads, the road works and the roads connecting to Erbil compared to the roads connecting to Slemani 
is mine who made it, for instance. We have very, very good roads connecting to Edley, whereas on the way to Slearline, you'll have potholes and uh, uh, speed bumps and all sorts of things which make traveling and transporting goods quite difficult between, between the major cities, which I think is what the region of Holyoke has done really well, Edley has done really well. They have looked at that and they have made roads and they continue to make roads. As you travel through Edley, you will see more roads, you see wider roads. Whereas you don't see as much going on in Um On the topic of on the topic of degree, uh, I spoke to some young people back home. Once again, they also brought up the differences between Erbil and Slemani. And I'm from Slemani myself, so I'd love to see Slemani doing well. But uh, but he spoke about his brother. His brother uh, has a civil engineering degree, and uh, he said that his brother finished his degree and for two years. He had to sit there and fiddle his fingers and take punch because he couldn't find his job in Slemani. He was applying everywhere and nowhere would accept him. Uh, he said there was 12 of them, friends, that finished that degree together. 11 of them are now in Erbil. It was a job within their, all, within their uh, sector. One of them uh, is in Slemani and he, he has a job. Fortunately, he has a job, but it's not within his sector. It's within so once again, why are we having these disparities? Um, could it be to do with regional governments? Could it be to do with uh, Erbil being closer to Turkey? So maybe there's more trade coming in and out. Um, I believe I read somewhere as well that uh, in Erbil they are trying to build a road like a motorway from Erbil all the way to Baghdad. Once that happens, if it happens, that's going to increase the trade threefold because capital city to capital city is, is more important. Uh, on this topic of uh, <coughs> statistics, however, I read in, uh, an article in Ruyal that the unemployment rate in Erbil is 13.1%, whereas in uh, Slemani it's 11.6%. Whereas when you talk to real people and when you re come back to reality, that doesn't seem to be the case. So, uh, as Belinda said, these statistics are very hard to control within our region and collect, collect them. On the topic of public sector work, public sector being 81% and also wages being delayed every single month, that's another thing which causes them. But, but it's not just within the public sector. People are going to leave the public sector with their wages being delayed. However, if people's wages are delayed, then they don't have money to go out there and spend within the private sector, which also causes uh, more unemployment. Uh, another thing that, unfortunately, I have experienced myself within the Kurd within, when in Kurdistan, actually, is we seem to, as a people, complain a lot about tourists when we're, when, when we're there. So uh, we will often hear, oh, these tourists are making Whereas we need to make a place for them to make sure that they come more because they're bringing in a lot of money to come up and see. I was in uh, Alanya this summer and there's a beautiful place there called Gold Pippin. So it's like a waterfall and they have all these things set up, restaurants, and people go there and they can spend the whole day there and you will spend a lot of money. And the tourists will spend a lot of money there. We have these beautiful regions such as Dukan, Kunamasi, Beakal within the Kurdistan region and there is no service for them. There, there is no nothing there. Um, we actually have relatives that um, are from Ahmawa and as we know Ahmawa is a very, very one of the top tourist destinations in Kurdistan. And um, they said that a major businessman came and offered them a lot of money for that land and he was going to turn it into basically what I'm describing as in Elania, like a mega, 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 mega project. Um, the locals turned it down and they said they don't want to sell their land because they're happy making what they what they make. They, they're happy with a steady income, with a, with a steady income. However, it doesn't help the country. That steady income doesn't help the country where a mega project such as that would bring in more tourists in that would spend more money in the region would help. On solutions 
security problems? We need to look at countries outside of our nation of Afghanistan. Um, been having grown up here, the one of the things that I have noticed in the UK, especially recently, is the rise of apprenticeships and how useful they have been in the UK, especially within the economy and for lower skilled jobs such as uh, build the building and contracting and that sort of stuff. Um, we could look at this and take this away and try to use it within our own nation to see how we can implement this to help better our economy and also lower unemployed, unemployment rates. I think the government needs to help as well um, in the sense that I don't believe there's many uh, degree degree programs, so uh, sorry, postgraduate programs. So um, my uncle personally, he finished his degree in geology, still hasn't been able to find a job, and he works in the public sector. Um, the reason <coughs> being that he doesn't know anyone, and I know, for example, in the UK, there's a statistic of something like 80% uh, of jobs aren't actually advertised in the UK. They're done through word of mouth, uh, and I'm not 100% sure on that statistic, but I believe it's around 80%. Uh, they don't do word of mouth. I tell my friend, oh, there's this job available, why don't you apply? He tells his friend. Same in Kurdistan. However, at least in the UK, we have these degree programs from major companies that help get young people into work, whereas we don't actually have any of that within the Kurdistan region. Um, another thing, we need better transport links. I mean, that's a main, for me, that's the biggest issue we have is our roads and infrastructure is not well enough. <coughs> and unfortunately, because of the region we are in, because of how there have been wars in the past and there have been so many problems, it actually makes it very difficult for foreign investment to come in because they're wary of, uh, for example, 2014 and ITK. They're wary of things like this. <coughs> they don't want to lose, lose their money directly. Um, and yeah, so mostly for me, it's the government. Three, it's three major points. The difference between Holy and Slemani, well, that can be fixed by fixing the roads and pedestrians within the Slemani region and all the other regions of uh, Kurdistan. The wages being late, so when the wages are late, that's a huge issue because that not only delays the public sector, it delays the private sector. And everything else and also we have a beautiful country so let's try to use it for tourism let's try to make it what it should be we should try and attract more tourists at the moment i believe the majority the majority of our tourists that are coming into the Kurdistan region are from the south of iraq whereas we should try and advertise the same thing saudi arabia has been doing with their projects and um, we can really, really learn and take a, take a uh, page out of their book uh, and how they dealt with this. They've had, they've held events. Last night they held a boxing event which has brought millions into that country. We have a country where we can actually do this because yes, it has been riddled with problems in the past. However, it's in a safe region. From when I go back, I feel safe there. And I believe other people. And we are, as we know, Kurds, we are quite friendly and we, we have quite a warm, welcoming attitude. So when tourists go there, especially when you look on the YouTube, if you look on YouTube, there's quite a few YouTubers that go uh, to obscure countries and, that, and they go to Kurdistan and they tell you, oh wow, the people are so lovely. Um, one thing I remember, I remember watching Top Gear back in the day when Jeremy Clarkson and them were there and they did a Christmas special where they traveled from Iraq all the way to Israel. But they arrived in Iraq because of what they had been told by media within the Western world. It's a war torn country, it's this and that. They had their uh, bulletproof vests on and they were scared. Like, they were really scared. Like, we need to get to Turkey straight away. So, they were in the Kurdistan region, they were driving down to Turkey. They got halfway through and they took their vests off because they said, What a safe place this is, what a welcoming place this is. And I think we need to show that to the world through our tourism. Thank you. Um, on the sort of uh, job advertisements in the UK, I work for a company where most of the jobs were internally resourced, so rather than word of mouth, I guess a lot of it is internal company recruitment, which um, doesn't bring the weather at all. I recruited a property in Brighton, I think, a 
valid point, but um, that's you know, something I think draw attention. So turning to our second speaker, Alan Ekas. Alan was born in Sweden. This is actually quite your birthday. That shows how young you are. But this is your first name in Sweden. So. His family are also originally um, from Romani in the same town region we are, as you all know. Um, he's the great grandson of Martin Kendi. And the claim is he was the first photographer in Iran. I think that's quite difficult to prove, but it's all kudos to the family and to your great uh, grandfather. But what we do know as well, he was the photographer of Jalal Talabani. So I think for all of us, that means he's uh, well. His great grandson documented a lot, really was significant in bringing the, the story and, and what was happening to the world. So that, that's fantastic. Um, your family's been instrumental across Kurdistan, fighting for social <coughs> and political causes that directly affect Kurdish people, historically actively involved in uh, Udin Peshmerga. Um, but Aban himself is committed to, whilst continuing peacefully in his family footsteps, um, he is an activist here in the UK um, while still a student in Canterbury. So that involves commitment and traveling and not always a lot of results when you're trying to be an activist in the UK. So again, kudos to yourself for all that you do and we look forward to hearing uh, your 10 minute contribution on this topic. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank Ivan um, for inviting me to the panel. I'd like to thank uh, Kurdish Progress. I'd like to thank NRP as well here. Um, unfortunately, mine's going to be a little bit shorter. I've gone much less into the specifics uh, of the reasons. I've got a, a general sort of bullet point documentation of uh, certain reasons which may be attributed to the causes uh, of uh, unemployment in Kurdistan. Well, it must be said that um, unemployment in Kurdistan is very, very multifactorial. Uh, it's not because of one thing. It's not because of two things. It's, it's a multitude of uh, factors. Uh, you know, obviously, Iraq has faced a uh, conflict for the last 40 years, which has immensely impacted the Kurdistan region, uh, whether it has been involved or whether it's spilled over or um, whatever else. Uh, it must be also said that COVID-19, of course, this is a recent cause. It's not a big one, but, you know, internationally, this devastated uh, both economies. Um, the war against ISIS uh, was, was also a heavy economic uh, blow to the Kurdistan region. Uh, we lost many great Peshmergas and uh, many injured as well from this, and it created a wave of unemployment. Um, we must also say that a lot of uni graduates are also not supported, as Mr. Bako also said, and there's not a lot of programs to ensure that these people are given job opportunities when they leave university. Um, we have a, a lot of foreign intervention as well. I'm not going to go too much into detail about that, however, uh, when you have certain areas that are controlled by, say, militias or, or, or different um, governments, etc., uh, a lot of the villages in Kurdistan, especially uh, Duhok, namely, are on the border of Zafor. There's a lot of areas that have been empty because civilians are unable to return back to these areas because of ongoing conflict. Um, we also, I'd like to talk about the, the thousands of uh, foreign workers that we have in Kurdistan. Now, this is a, a very controversial issue because I'm not sure how to exactly explain it, however, there must be some sort of something that's not happening either by the government or the intergovernmental organizations that are uh, involved in uh, these exchange workers. Um, either the Kurds are not doing the jobs that are given to the, to the foreign workers or they're not being provided. So it must be, uh, that one must be talked about as well. I'd say that uh, there are also poorly managed institutions uh, um, that you know they are corrupt. Uh, to what extent we're not sure. However, um, it can also be said that thank you. Yeah. When we come into the issue of wages, now wages in Kurdistan they're either not given at certain months or they're just very very low incomes, and this forces a lot of Kurdish uh, people to, to enter different jobs. Um, unfortunately, many businesses and projects require government approval. 
and this means that a lot of people may not wish to indulge uh, with these uh, organizations and governments because a lot of the time uh, you must, uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to give their loyalty in, in exchange for money or for jobs, and therefore a lot of people are left on their own and left pretty much helpless uh, in what to do. There's also cultural factors to consider. Yes, uh, the government uh, can be at fault. Yes, there is a lot of external, internal reasons. However, culturally, we must also accept that Iraq, Kurdistan, Kurdish people do not have the highest IQ. Uh, in a lot of the villages, uh, the, 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 there's a very little desire to learn and study, and which also affects you know, jobs, obviously, and employment, and therefore, uh, the low IQ and the undesired to learn and to work uh, also contributes to unemployment. However, Kurdistan is amongst the largest oil reserves in the world, uh, but because of oil export issues in Baghdad, uh, much of the profit is either hidden from the public eye or the money isn't being seen by the people. And so uh, the, the, there must be uh, an increase in employment in the oil sector. However, we're not seeing it because the oil sector uh, in Kurdistan is, is, is very hidden and uh, not a lot of people know about it. Um, also, there was the emphasis of uh, a very short, uh, very little work in the private sector. Um, this, is, uh, this is very problematic because it means that a lot of jobs are free for government grants or approvals and therefore uh, there's a lot of, um, there's not much emphasis on, uh, you know, being independent from the private sector. And yeah. Yeah. No, I think there's some uh, very interesting points that have happened in the Q&A there, and um, I look forward to many people doing that. So some nuggets dropped there, which will be expanded, I'm sure, later. <coughs> So we turn now to our third speaker, right on time, well done. Um, Dr. Rahman Nouri, I don't know if you need too much introduction. He, he does do a lot of speaking and he has helped a lot of people. Um, and being a journalist, he's around quite a lot. Um, he has got a lot of American foreign policy, international and domestic politics of the Middle East. I don't know, should we call it West Asian now? What That's do you think? Probably Middle East. You're okay, yeah. you're, you're okay with it. I'm on for West Asia myself, but that's okay. Um, Nuri is currently lecturer <coughs> in international relations at the University of West London, not very nearby, uh, where he was lecturing until 5 p.m., so again, well done for getting here. And an honorary research fellow at Sydney University of London. Wow. Now, um, Dr. Barman's uh, work and her research into the effects corporations and elite elements has had in Iraq. So right on top. Um, and it, on its, the effect it's had also on its domestic and political landscape, that's much broader. So he's mm -hmm. argued that the study and social forces of US power played an important part in understanding the nature of their decision making in US foreign policy. So again, a wide political topic. So by exploring the decisions taken by American elites, as they call them here, in the Iraq war, Nori argues that the decisions and agendas of the US elites sued in Iraq were driven by corporate elite interests. So Nuri specifically emphasizes the nature of US power, what drives it, and what looks like its legacies. So again, that's a very massive topic. But we are inviting in only 10 minutes um, Dr. Hassan Nuri to talk very much to this topic, um, which I think is, uh, is key here. So with all your research and all your work, we're looking forward to hearing your insights and your solutions for the problem of unemployment in Kurdistan. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Belinda. Thank you, Kurdish Progress. And of course, to see the microphone now and to the ones who've been here. Uh, great insights already, to be honest. Not that much for me to add. Uh, although here in Kag, uh, and Kaga, they give me the context uh, of, of what I'm about to talk about. I thought they give stats, figures, uh, in a very, very diplomatic way. And as they were speaking, especially the diplomacy of Kagan, who made me kind of think of my role here on the panel tonight, which will probably be a lot more critical 
on the public sector payroll. That means that those who turned out to vote, voted for their own interests, voted for their livelihoods, for their jobs, etc. There's a 57% people that are not impressed by these ideologies of these political parties talking the same narrative and the rubbish that we've been talking for years. Because simply put, the Iraq and the Kurdistan that you have in 2021 or 2023 is different to the Kurdistan of the 90s and the Peshmerga era or post-2003 in terms of 2005 to 9. This is a Kurdistan that faces climate challenges, that is facing a mental health crisis. One of the things that upset me on this panel today is that we should have had another woman uh, speaking on the panel, and obviously with all respect to you, Dylan, you can express that voice. Because when you have uh, unemployment issues and economic challenges, the men have it better than the women. It's normally women who have to bear the brunt of that. It would be great to have that narrative now, and we can speak in to do with uh, your organization, which we credit to you anyway. So there, there's, there's loads of kind of different things to, to think about. And coming back to the statistics that I mentioned there, if we had a free market, these political parties wouldn't win votes. Any political party that has come with actual ideology and long-term aims has been discredited, has been almost ousted, kind of rammed off the political uh, arena. And for, for these elites, I can't see how enabling a free market, a market where businesses can operate freely, because on the ground right now, these elites might say in X, Y, and Z that they have a free market, but I could open a business tomorrow, or there's friends of mine that have businesses that write to me all the time in, in COVID platforms because they're that scared. They have businesses and they have to pretend that they're not doing well economically and financially because otherwise different elements of political parties, ruling political parties, approach them, try to take money off them, and if they disagree or they're even late to respond to their demands, they burn their businesses down, they target them physically, and there's all sorts of other uh, repercussions. So my kind of argument is that we need a free market. We need corporations that come to Kurdistan, not just be centered around oil contracts and uh, you know, business deals that serve this elite that continue to get wealthier at the expense of the general Kurdish population. We need corporations to come in the transparent process and say, right, we have over 300,000 Iraqis entering the job market every single year. What can corporations bring to that specific issue? We don't need more oil contracts. What we need is corporations that will build infrastructure, but we don't get any of that because if we had infrastructure and more private sector employment, we'd see more and more decline of the traditional political parties. And that gives me optimism to kind of I don't know if I need 10 minutes or not. It gives me optimism that, and I argued it the last time I was here, but again, I don't think it's my job to provide solutions, but I will kind of hint at it. Iraq is in need of a new intellectual paradigm. You talked about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia's got a whole new intellectual paradigm. The UAE, United Arab Emirates, had an intellectual paradigm from the 2000s that this was our vision, this is what every single element of our country and of our state is going to aim towards. Every single institution, every single person, every single scholarship, every single education uh, element that we have, we don't have that paradigm. We have a paradigm from the 90s, from the 80s, created by two historic political dynasties that served well in a very, very good you know, history of, of fighting and Kurdish survival, but that era has changed now. So, that's my kind of um, kind of concluding remarks. And the other thing that I want to allude to here is that when you have a Kurdish region that had so much expectation placed on it, because the other question I get from Kurdish audiences is why do we talk about the KRG in the Kurdish region and not in other parts of Kurdistan? Because this region was meant to be the pinnacle. It was meant to be the first step in autonomy and independence. This was meant to be the, the, where the, the first domino falls and we see an effect over time in an eventual Kurdish state. Not only has that not happened, but the Kurdish question is now one of the furthest questions 
in Middle East politics and even global power dynamics. The Kurdish authorities of the Tehran regime, without naming any of them, or examples, have kind of you know taken the whole Kurdish question back and retrogressed. And that's why the remarks on the well, thank you very much. That was quite moving, um, and I agree with you. There's no, um, you can't rush solutions, and um, there's a lot to be said about what the issues are, and I think we've had a lot of business to get to the next 10 minutes. And I hope that also then will springboard um, remembering all three speakers who are nice, long, and deliberate and thinking Q&A session. So I would like to invite uh, the audience to come with their questions and we will direct them. If you have a particular time limit you want to direct them to, or you can just <coughs> put a question there and, and I'll see if we can send it to you. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Bartan Bekesh, I'm a doctor. Uh, I'm trained in Sweden, I'm a consultant in the UK, been here for nearly 40 years and an independent political as well and um, uh, a good Kurd put in that way. Uh, I have faith in the Kurdish issue. I think personally the main problem nowadays before and even now in the Iraqi Kurdistan is the political environment. Um, the, the political environment in, in Kurdistan is not stable. Um, the region of the Kurdistan is divided to different parts. We have influence of the regional uh, powers in the area where they bombarded, where they attacked us, where they showed the respect to us, they bombard our villages. We all know about that, and that, as Ellen mentioned, that causes some problems. And any political instability in any country causes chaos. When there's no political stability, uh, unemployment is just a tiny thing. So unemployment is one of the uh, problems we face now, but it's not the whole problem. We, we have lots of problems. We have problems with Baghdad. We have problems um, about the gas. The petrol Kurdistan is a very rich country. Uh, we have a lot of gas in all the level of international petrol is one of the second or the third resource of gas in the whole world on the planet Earth. So we shouldn't beg for money or for anything. We need the political stability. I think if we have a political stability and we have a good relationship among the political parties and we sort out our problem with Baghdad, I think unemployment is a tiny thing compared to the, the big problem. I personally worked many years with the um, non-governmental organizations in the end of the Iran-Iraq war and we had the Baghdad at that time were more than 138 non-governmental organizations and I worked with a couple of them. We bought um, small hospitals, we did tomato fields, for example, we did um, bee um, fields, we brought um, uh, lots of machines to do agriculture. So we helped through this organization to build part of the country. So the country needs more stability politically, first of all. It doesn't matter how rich we are because there's corruption. So if you are stable politically and uh, you treat the corruption, I think th that will affect very positively on the unemployment issue. Thank you. Well, I'm hearing a lot of agreement there with what our last uh, speaker said. Um, I don't know if you'd also like to bring a question because I think it's aligned what you were saying. Do you have a question for the speaker? Yes, I would like to um, ask you, what, what, how can we help the Iraqi Kurds uh, in this dilemma now. What, what are the solutions? Are the solutions can be done um, internally in, in, inside Kurdistan? Or we have to ask the superpowers, countries like UK, America, Germany, and neutral countries or other countries to help us with ideas to improve um, the situation because we are in chaos now, as you mentioned. You, we have resources, but we cannot use it in the proper way. We, we are in trouble. We, we are we are in a struggle with neighboring countries. We are we are in a struggle with Baghdad. So we need a political stability in the area in order to be able to, to, to help everyone. So what are the solutions in your mind, in your views? Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, will that directly link? Yes. Okay. Thank you. It's impossible in the time that we have to give an adequate response to exactly the solution. But one of the things that I talked about in the conclusion of my book was <coughs> a missing element, which is an intellectual paradigm. A refresh set of ideas and visions for the Kurdish region and probably for Iraq as well if it wants to pull itself out of the region in a different way. And these visions should align, as I said before, with all the various education sectors. We have students now in this region that are learning things that are completely irrelevant to the state of the world, to the Kurdistan political system, to the challenges of Kurdistan politics. And it's one of those things we've got all different institutions all kind of doing different things. We need a realignment of almost every single element of the infrastructure through a grand vision that unites the country. We're not going to have that, simply put, because a grand vision means a unified, unified Kashmir. It means going back to a unity that the Kurds haven't enjoyed since 2003-2004. In my book, I talk about the constitution making process, the 2005 constitution, in great detail. Where was every single Indrush Lahad? Who said what? Where did Jana go? How was this made? How parts of it was made in the north? Parts of it down south? Do you know who the biggest winners of that constitution were? The Kurds. And do you know who the most unified group were by a long country mile? The Kurds. The unity that we had enabled us to create a document that pretty much give us our own independent, almost independent government. We squandered that. We ate politics, we ate power, this historical use of nationalism, the guy modern day politics. We don't have a proactive government, we have a reactive government. Something happens, the government reacts. We don't have a long term strategy, we don't have a strategy to deal with existing challenges. For me, it's a bigger project of an intellectual paradigm. And I'll give you a context. Neoliberalism, the whole paradigm for the West that we have now, that's now being reviewed in America. The Hewlett Foundation dedicated $50 million to come up with a new common sense because neoliberalism and this extreme capitalism doesn't work for the climate and climate change and sustainability. That's on one scale as a review. Where is our conversations around the climate? This, this summer, <coughs> I have young kids. I want them to go back. The stories that I was told, um, and corroborated by various from the NRT with some stories on this, newborn toddlers or, or babies being driven around in cars, the basic, you know, because of the heat is too much, there's no electricity infrastructure driven around in their cars, polluting the evening air just because it was too hot for these children to sleep. We need a whole new ideology that unifies the Kurds back to that constitution moment. But if you come back to the argument that we're a group of people that never had, and then when we get money and power, it's created a mass corruption and division that I don't think through <coughs> civilized means or outside intervention can be solved. That's the sad reality. And I'm not of the era that was a Peshmerga. I'm not of the, the era that, that saw these bloodbaths. But all I see as a political analyst is that every single level can maintain the system as it is. There is no interest in change from within these political parties. I've advised, I've written books, I've written chapters, I've worked with you know, big institutions in, in the West, they're putting millions, they have been putting millions into making some of these changes. The resistance is unbelievable. And it's almost as if um, Sadat Aziz is a Kurdish scholar, uh, a good friend of mine, and he, he wrote a piece recently about how the Kurds seem to keep elongating and extending all of the support from the outside world, especially America, the UK, Netherlands, and in the way that he, he called me and he said, how do I put this into English? And I said, what is it that you want to say? He said, 
قاسی دیگه وش کودکان و کم وقت آن دارن گوش دارن آدم از کودکان خویانی دیگه میکنن. The solutions are so simple. We have all the resources to implement it. So power, greed, corruption, elite, dynastic politics has messed up this uh, region of the world. And until we have that consensus, I, I honestly think climate change, what will be invented in the years time, because it's time will be a little displaced that we all go back to now is you know diaspora. I don't think we'll even be able to holiday there anymore. A lot of people can't holiday there in the summer. They have to look at other countries. And this is happening because our real time politics is unable to forecast for the future. They're dealing with hand to mouth daily politics, budgets, money, currency at the expense of ordinary people. So I'm sorry. Not to be able to speak in, in an optimistic way in that regard, but the solutions, the multi billion pound institutions, I think the EU has 500 million uh, pounds dedicated to, to support and implementing some of these policies, but we've got to take them, we've got to push the side because it disrupts this elite party. The problem is that if we don't say Kurdistan now, it will be a disaster. That's the problem. So the clock is ticking now. So, so we are surrounded by enemies, and we are more unified. So we need, uh, um, uh, um, we need to unite, and we have to throw up a, a program, a strategy for future of our new generation. Otherwise, we will be in trouble. And this is all here. Thank you. Would you like to add something? Yeah, on, on the topic of uniting uh, Kurdistan, uh, I have I have a saying that I like to say. Uh, unfortunately, in Kurdistan, politics is inherited. It's not thought of. So. Whoever your granddad used to vote for or fought for, that's who you're going to vote for. You're not going to think, oh, I'm going to look at this political party and see what they want to actually do. And that's one thing we need to do is probably start by changing people's minds and stop thinking along those lines. And I think we have had slow but steady start already, because when you go back, you see people like Tyre, these dynasty that you mentioned. And not only have they done this, they have created such separation within Kurdistan itself. Uh, but could be in Kurdish we call it Shad Chetty. A lot of Kurds will do Shad Chetty for the from the city they're from, they're proud of that city and they will die for that city, but they don't look look at the person next to them and they say, oh, I don't want I don't want them. Which is causing problems again with unemployment unemployment because it's the it's one another and sorry. It's also causing political tensions because these cities each vote for a different political party. Each of these cities are each run by a different political party. And that's what's caused these divisions. These fights have caused these divisions. And until we unite, especially uh, Mr. Dr. Lamar said about the Hezhmerga being united, that to me is one of the major, major issues within the Kurdistan region. <coughs> the fact that we have all these little families that have their own. Um, and corporations that they can <coughs> use their might to take money off people or not let people do business. Um, I have a friend, uh, he was in Slemani, and Dr. Mamon spoke on him as well. Um, he had a company and he said that he wanted to do something new in his company. He wanted to register it. It was a uh, medical tourism company. He wanted to register it. He wasn't allowed to register it until he paid a fine. Who does this fine go to? Someone came, took the money, and said, okay, you can do it now. No receipts, no documents, nothing. This fine just goes into the pocket now, and that's it. So once again, by uniting people, I think we need to get rid of this idea of political agendas being inherited. I don't need to vote for who my dad votes for. I have my own mind. I can look at things and see, is this political party looking at this mind? So I'm a university student. I always advocate for the youth. Um, it's something I'm particularly interested in. And what I want to ask about is how education affects unemployment. Often we see our youth back home in Kurdistan um, throwing away their dreams because they don't get the grades they need to become a doctor, which is soft. They don't, like 100%, sorry, speaking Kurdish. Um, they don't get the grades 
like to whatever degree they want what are we doing to ensure that something like this doesn't affect our future generation what can we do so something like this doesn't affect our kids their grandkids i don't know yeah i'd say again this is why i, I give some emphasis to culture because culture uh, culture has everything to do with uh, how this is run. Uh, culture, even within the Kurdish Ashaya, the, the way that Kurdish people live are very Ashaya, um, uh, in the sense of what my dad does is what I do, the way my tribe or my clan or, or the way my village lives is how I uh, rule. I don't like red, and red doesn't like me, blue doesn't like me, uh, Suleimani doesn't like Hode, Hode doesn't like Suleimani. Um, uh, you can also talk about the Iraqi Kurdish civil war in the 1990s. This is a whole that has been left in. in uh, for the last 30 years uh, since it occurred. That's something that will never be forgotten. Um, the fact that we were able to, you know, uh, unitedly fight against Saddam, uh, and then we had uh, the, the KDP, which was really only the, the only Kurdish party at the time. Then we had uh, Namja come along and formed the PK. Uh, that was a uh, little division there. Um, but it's fascinating to me the, the way we um, were able to uh, go from that to then a war against each other, and now I'd say that uh, Yecheki and Pati are more in a cold war, um, and it's about breaking the culture of Slaymani hates Hodeh, and Hodeh doesn't like Slaymani. Um, that's all I have to say. I think, just adding to that, sorry, uh, just that Ellen said uh, before in the speech as well about um, people, a lot of Kurds in the village not being educated, educated enough to make the education system don't actually <coughs> for their day. What they need to know about the agricultural department. That's where we think in the UK with apprenticeship, where they can look at. Yeah, so apprenticeships a lot of time is in the UK. We have degree apprenticeship, and we have low skill apprenticeship. We can look at how we can implement new apprenticeships within our system. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe final thing to on me to say on that. Why do we have to be? doctors, lawyers, and engineers. And look, the world has changed since then. There's almost so many different things going on now that we should be promoting graduates or creating graduates based on the needs of the country and the challenges the country faces. That's what everyone wants to do. I'm a one room world ambassador. When I graduated from university, I just wanted to get a job and you know, buy a house and that was it. This generation of graduates now are going into a climate crisis. Their future, they're insecure because of previous generations of race and, and various other things. So why, why are we not breaking that? Why are we not understanding simple things like you don't just get your education from university. The corporation that you work for is your biggest source of knowledge or the environment you work in after you leave your studies. Having that corporate environment in the region, private environment, outside of these walled down uh, government institutions, that's kind of one part of it. The other element really is understanding that we're all complicit in how things are now. I sat down with the one of the main UK figureheads in 2018, I won't mention names, but if you want to do your basic research, you'll see who it was. And I was making a point about a similar thing. In that mentality of this particular elite, and quite senior elite, is that we need to draw a line right close to this argument of maybe not my parents directly, but my parents' generation. There was a whole generation that went back to Kurdistan, took money for land, took the years that they were away as a retirement package as if they worked, and then got these big sums of money, got employment. And at that time, they may not realize that if this is how I get my job, that tomorrow, this same culture is going to affect my children. And now you've got a generation, the parents versus the children. The parents are employed by the PUK or the PUP, and the child is on PUBG. The child wants to go out and smash up the country with his friends if he can. But daddy and mommy are saying, it's OK, son. You take some money from me, stay at home, don't do anything. <coughs> this is also that same culture that we need to, to, to break. We need to understand that there's no shame now in really unifying this new struggle and challenge. And we're also tired 
has a has a ethnicity, has a Greek or Spanish with very with the Peshwar days and, and fighting them. Now we face political parties with the issues, and it seems to be one one process after the other. But maybe we can lobby our politicians a little bit. Uh, who's firm a little bit? Uh, that, that, that's an important question. Maybe those politicians that we have here, and I know we said this is the the government of the year because we saw uh, all the different important meetings and events there. But those same governments that sell weapons and products, Range Rovers, maybe we can lobby our MPs to take more of a you know, stronger stance in this region and to hold some of these elites accountable because without the support like this, our elites wouldn't have the power and authority that they have, or the Um Thank you. My name is Rikas Ali. Um, thank you for Kurdish progress and thank you for your um, liberal democracy. Um, I would like to share my experience or my thoughts in the UK and also I'm a presenter for the Kurdish diaspora center in London. Also, I've got a um, charity called International Fish Market Humanitarian Foundation, which is I have 18 branches in Kurdistan. I would like to share my ideas and experience how I successful the UK. Therefore, we have to proud our countries as a Kurdish. As we know, we had a COVID-19 everywhere, so we didn't have experience in our country. So that COVID-19 affecting a lot for us. When the country, like within 13 years, our countries, we bring a lot of universities now. So there is no education <coughs> in, in, in other countries apart from Kurdistan. We have free education. So we need to, our young generation, to use skills and also sharing the ideas. So, one mistake we done so um, in my view in the past, which is we didn't use the people from the other country they have experience. We should use them to bring them to Kazakhstan and to give the experience to our young um, people. Our country is moving very well, as you see the progress very well. So the good things is about our country they that everyone can come. I was surprised uh, Mr. Bakri had some bad experience he said the foreigners came to our Kurdistan, so we didn't respect. It wasn't so much about respect. I know. However, it's, it's yeah, just, my argument is, yeah, my argument is, 45% um, of the foreigner people now they work in Kurdistan. So our young people, we need more training, we, we need more teaching, we need to more connection with other trainers. So my question is, I don't want to go too, too far, otherwise um, there's a lot of good things I have to show about my uh, country, government, and the nation. The good things are, I'm very happy and I'm proud for my country. We never had a problem with the religious problems which they face in other countries. Sunnis now, I don't know which, uh, in Kurdistan, I don't know who's Shia, who's Sunni, who's white, or black, and wherever it is. We have a lot of friends in different cities. We never, we never have this problem. We never ask this question. That was it behind the thing we did things, not as a nation. So I created the charity in 2009 in the UK. So I've been to Kurdistan. So I have 3,200 volunteers in Kurdistan. So they do working in the sector, health sector, which is 1,800. We do operation free for the people they need it, for the private hospitals. And also we teach them, we, we, we did some training them. The people, they, they didn't have a chance to go to school <coughs> in the past, wherever, any reason. So we give them a teaching to write and write in Kurdish to understand. So our charity, we, we believe that anyone can do that if, if they believe themselves. So the only thing is not only, only government. The problem for young generation in our Kurdistan, they want to finish university and they, they said to the government, this is my qualification, forget about my skill and wherever I have, I want to use to give me a job. 
that's really this is we had in the past this is a big mistake we did so now the question is for you um guys how we could bring it as you know we lost a lot of companies they went back when the ice joined the iraq with kurdistan special so how we bring in all these organizations the charities to go to kurdistan to give ourselves to the to the education we have any sector over there so there is a, there is there is a, a option so we can get the to give advertising a lot of jobs for them so that for that time if they have a job they are not run away from the country people they can mostly people they run away from the country it's i'm not saying because they don't have a political issue but they have the imitation like you know they they just wanted to see whether how their life in europe is so so many people now in in kurdistan they have their own business they have successful business <coughs> so in my experience when i went to kurdistan i know our people that are very educated and very brave and very strong so all my question is how we bring in the people from the uk for example kurdish people that have experience let's have organized or campaign to bring to kurdistan to give the um the good chance for that our young generation thank you so much um, i personally actually have been offered quite a few jobs in kurdistan over the last years since i graduated but i decided to do the master's instead um that's also an issue i've been offered a job because i have a degree from the uk a person with the same degree as me would not have been offered a job if they had completed their university education within Kurdistan. But I have been offered it because my well, I have the same experience. I've just come out of university. I've just completed it. However, my my degree is seen as more for theirs. Why do we have this disparity? I actually have got quite a few people back on me about why they uh, what they actually learn. And I've looked up and they learn. Some of the stuff they learn is a lot harder than the stuff that we're learning. And some of the stuff that they actually actually study, especially within the Kurdistan Tech Polybanza, just before they go into university, it's very, very difficult. That's some of the stuff we actually learn in universities in our degree. So they actually have quite a high level of education. The only problem is their piece of paper doesn't count for us. Whereas ours does. And that with the, to answer your question. Yes, we can bring people like me to go back to Kurdistan. However, how much is the wages? The average wage in Iraq, in Iraq the region, is, uh, I believe it's five hundred dollars a month. Is that enough for me to go to go back? Is that en enough of an incentive for someone living within the UK to go back to that region to work? No, that's what I've been high offered higher wages. Even then, I look at it and like, okay, well, I can still make more in the UK and uh, we discussed about why do people want to become doctors and, and this sort of stuff within the Kurdistan region one cultural cultural and religious religious aspect in and make good money and make good money yeah so then the corruption starts from this point yeah. <laughs> so we the, the, the culture tells us uh, as a kid even my parents when I was a kid my mom was like go on you can become a doctor you should be you're very clever you should become a but that's not what I want but luckily, because my parents were here, they so in our culture we've been taught to direct our kids <coughs> uh, towards a doctor because it brings us here within our religion and it's it's a good thing that we're that we're doing. Two, yes, the money. The reason people want to be a doctor is because that's the only job, especially within cosmetics. That's another thing we can talk about. Uh, medical tourism. Our cosmetics industry within the Kurdistan region. In Slema, in every corner you turn, there's a different hospital, there's a different pharmacy, or mostly linking to cosmetics. Is it bad or good? I think it's a good thing. So I believe that it's a good thing if it's regulated. Because of the fact it's not regulated to the point where <coughs> Westerners can look at it like Turkey and say, like, oh, you know what? For example, a nose job in Turkey, a nose job in Turkey would cost you $2,000. Whereas in Iraq, it would cost you $500. There's a big difference. Why are people not going to Iraq? Many reasons could be they feel that it's unsafe because of what's happened in the past and media, the media scrutiny. Uh, and also, they don't know the regulations. And it's not advertising. 
So that's one thing we need. So like the job I said, we need an organization to come and actually advertise these things to the Western world. That will once again bring in more money to the health industry, to the tourism industry, because we have beautiful hotels within the region that could house these tourists that are coming in for medical purposes. And being a doctor, like I say, that's the only job that's going to get you a little bit of money. It's either that or you have a business. And when you have a business, usually, like Dr. Gumma said, you have to have some political aim. So it's it's very hard to be you for that. I actually thank you for all of you. I'm really proud for that. I think and those uh, gentle young people here really teaching you a lot and understand and and you care about the country and the people and the people. My name is uh, Majad Mohammed, and I'm a solicitor, and I'm the director of the law firm in the UK. Uh, I did my master is about the business of employment and legal analysis, which is the, about employment law. Uh, most of the issue and the point, uh, thank you for doctor, he uh, liked it, most of that things, and I want to like, uh, mention about that. But actually, the, he already mentioned about the the politics, the issue here is politics actually in Kurdistan. We have no issue. We have issue with the people as well. Like people, they should accept that they, they ask the government, they ask them for that to pay tax, for example. They don't reject it. It should be to do that as well. Like we came into this, this country, how we, we stand to, on our food and we, we try to protect ourselves without even the problem. Even the any government to help us in the beginning. We did everything for ourselves. We have an issue, we have a problem actually here with the politics in Kurdistan region. And this politics, this politics people is not coming just from other countries. They grow up in the same area, in the same place. So the government in the in Kurdistan or in Iraq or there responsible for people to make them the ready to start to, the, to find a job or other sector of the, um, like a doctor he said about that, we have a good resource about the oil in the, in the Kurdistan region. So in the Kurdistan there is so many uh, company, which is the established in Kurdistan, even the foreign company as well. When we go back to the taxation to us, 80% of the people, they don't pay tax. The problem that the, they have some other people, they cover them, they don't pay. So there's so many actually issue about the corruption. That's the issue, I think, because of people that are unemployed in Kurdistan or in Iraq as well. So if we start from the point of the solution, I don't think so, uh, only the government, or only the, because all together we should to vote and we should be, uh, people we are, when we are here, if you have not the issue, this big issue, I don't think nobody of us, they stay here. We do the same job in my country. What is the reason I'm here to do the job? And I'm talking about very big talk about the unemployment and those things, so I think, the issue, the politics, and uh, I, I, I can't see the government actually. The only, the, there is so many parties in Kurdistan and they work together and they build together what they can make for themselves. Not for future, not for generation, not for other people. Only for themselves. So uh, this is that I would see actually in my video that I'm happy to have that. I really thank you for all of you. How much do you know about the Ministry of Statistics in Kurdistan? Do, do they have a statistic about how many people will be educated and how many people go to certain college and university and how many teachers, how many 
doctors, how many plumbers we produce per year, according to the need of, of, of the region, because there are six million people, there should be a balance between the number of teachers and doctors and plumbers and drivers. I'm sure in, in every European country there's been the Ministry of Statistics where they um, know exactly how many children in each branch, you know, any, any kind of teaching and what's the need of the country for the next, I mean, at least 50 years. Do we have some <coughs> statistics in Turkey? It's a very important point. <coughs> not only do we not have that, <coughs> as a researcher, Having written a book, numerous book chapters, <laughs> as far back as my PhD, this was my biggest struggle to find credible data <coughs> about these very things. So, as a researcher, I have to rely on all of the various different organizations and NGOs, maybe, that operate in the region. And each will focus on one element. So, for example, you have the UNAMI, the United Nations Assistance for Aid Mission in Iraq. They're banging on about their statistics that we have 300 K graduates every year entering the job market. Uh, and you have the EU talking about 75, you know, over 70% of Iraq. Iraq's population is considered a youth population under the age of 30. So there's bits and bobs of statistics, but we don't have the infrastructure or even the capacity financially now with this public sector payroll to have government institutions that measure that. Although we are doing this kind of KRG IT thing that we're having now, which is really uh, where it needs to be in terms of functionality, but official statistics we don't have. If we had that, that would be the very first starting point to not just know where to go, but to also increase government accountability. We don't have that. We rely on NGOs and outside sources. And even their data is skewed. Talk about the decompensation project and how that affects the numbers for unemployed or so. Not much, but on that <coughs> topic of mm -hmm. linking quite a few things together. Um, so wages being delayed, people might get their wages. Um, not they're not being certain sectors not being relegated. If we had at one point a problem in Kurdistan with there being too many taxi drivers, with the market being di diluted, because people weren't getting their wages on time. So what they would do is they would go and buy a taxi and in the evening after their work, because for the work they do in the morning as a teacher, they're not getting paid. In night time there'd be a taxi driver and because there were so many of them it was diluted there's an actual taxi driver that needed to live off of this income alone we're not making enough money to be able to live once again this links everything so we did have a statistics um, division where it could tell us okay we're gonna have to give out only this many this certain amount of taxi licenses and this certain amount of this and this certain. it would really help the region not only with unemployment yes if you get all driver taxis none of them are technically unemployed because they will have Technically, about how much are they actually making? Can they live off of, <coughs> live off of that? But in this country, uh, people they have three jobs: McDonald's, Uber, and then other jobs in housing jobs. So it's just like in my country. I remember like two years ago, the government decided who, if you went to the government, work with the government, is not allowed to have a taxi. Do you know that? Okay, but for example, I'm from Wolverhampton. In Wolverhampton, a couple of years back, we had an issue where the Wolverhampton Council were giving out too many taxi licenses, and uh, the other councils weren't giving giving people taxi licenses. So there were people coming from Bradford who lived in Bradford, got a taxi license in Wolverhampton, and were using that license in uh, Bradford. The Wolverhampton Council got in a lot of trouble for doing this because they were diluting, once again, diluting the market and not making making people not be able to earn a decent living. So that's what I mean by that term region. If you think about how many of certain things we need, we need to use our regulations to tell us what we need that term. Yeah, uh, my name is Sefko Nasuzangara. I'm from uh, the Kala region and Suleiman region. For example, the employment, the one you guys were talking about, um, if I'm from a family of the PK party, 
And if I was just a normal person living from, uh, from that region, if I decided to go um, living in Holyam, uh, also known as Erbil, um, I've heard that a lot of people, they wanted to do that far because of, not even if they're not, even if they have no involvement in any political party, they won't be able to get given a job just because of their family. And like, I feel like that has a very big effect. Um, yeah. Once again, the point I was making is politics being inherited. Yeah. Your, your grandparents and your parents. So what they have done actually, not only does it mean our oh, vote for them, but it impacts your future, future as well. However, I don't believe that's the case having spoke to people like I have friends in Suleiman that are now working, working in Erbil. So I don't believe that's the case as much. Maybe if, let's say, their parents are political figureheads or they, they're well known, maybe then it might cause, <coughs> cause an issue. However, with just normal civilians, I don't believe that's an issue. I think sometimes it's right because I've been coming a few months ago up in um, September, she has that. They've been throw eggs on me, not one, not two, not three, a few times. I'm very hard sometimes to come to Parliament to enjoy myself, like to have in some question. Just because I'm a member of the political party and every time I came like around here or they invite me very hard for me I didn't do anything wrong for example just because I'm in the member of the, the uh, one of the political party and it is really uh, that mentality it goes to come here not just in, in my country it, it just like two days ago I was came to parliament and as soon as they see me they said this is a corridor I don't want to do explain in English. That was really, this is making me so, so angry that I didn't, uh, I didn't know what I do. <laughs> then I went back and then I said, no, I'm going to wait. I've been here until 11 o'clock in Parliament. I have no way for me to go out to go home. And I came here because I've been invited for a different organization. I want more experience. The reason I came here, I want to meet people in my country, meet other people to get more experience and use it to other the volunteers I have in Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I really, I have a question. Yeah. 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 I just have a question for Neil. You, because I know you very well, you are very close to your Barzani family, and now you say- I'm a Barzani family. <laughs> yeah. And you're talking about, uh, okay, everyone do a free job here as well. You might not have a new birth. I just want to ask you, Barzani son, uh, do he work in other sector shelter or something like that in Arabi? He used to be a farmer, why not? And then everybody changed. Do I, they do now? So they, they, do the they prime, work in other sector shelter? The prime minister why here, our they young people that. they have to do? And when they come in here and sitting like that and do and stay in the most uh, expensive hotel, so, and 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 not, the so please yeah. they deserve to throw an egg on it. Sorry. They are not, that's why we talk about education. That's why we talk about education. If you have like, a great education, they never throw the egg on me. Because uh -huh. for the no what reason. They can do. What they can do? Uh, government, Barzani family, or whole government, the Iraqi government, Kurdistan government, they do nothing for, for the people, for the young uh, man like them. They do nothing. This is the Maybe they do something yeah. for you because you are so close to them, but they not do anything for the other people, not for my brother. Can we let him <coughs> yes. I think, uh, unfortunately, um, regardless of what, what political side we're on, I think that we don't want eggs being thrown about, and we don't also want um, a lot of other things happening from both sides. It's sort of like a sort of like a war between the government and, and activists, which can't run. Uh, to be honest. Um, I'm not picking a side, I'm staying very neutral, but I, I don't want to see either side because both sides lose a lot of credibility, right? Exactly. Yeah. Can, I ask, can I ask a question, sorry, because uh, I've, I've just found out you're from the Bazaar family. Um, no, we are you well close to close. To yeah. I don't want to be like, um, I'm coming here to the different panel, yeah. because if I want to answer, it's a very easy to answer to the GM, even if it's my friends here, but this today is not about the PDK, and the government, no, it's and the government. It's, 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 yeah, okay, that's fine. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, you said you have a, a charity, a charity organization within Yeah. 
do you think you would have been able to set up that charity organization within Kurdistan or not only set it up, make it as big as it is without the political backing that you have had? Let me, let me tell you one thing. You don't, maybe you don't know me much. I've got very, um, a lot of recording from the TV channel and stuff. You know, this charity is independent. This charity. I'm not saying that uh, the party in my party or the party they tried to pull me out for that election at all. I always to, the, to say to the other volunteers, stand as an independent, but outside of my charity, do whatever you want. That's why I was doing that. Here in my charity, there is there's different color, different politician, but no one doing like other politicians. Only humanitarian stuff where they need the special, maybe special. Because we are designed for the people who suffer from the war, Yazidis and you know the people who suffer from the ISIS. But outside the uh, my organization, do whatever you like, do whatever you do. But if you come to our organization, of course no, I don't live. So I didn't get any support from the any political action issue in Kurdistan, not at all. Only the government, because I'm close to them. Of course, if I came here, I have to explain who I am. And then I would tell them what's my job I came from. That's what I did. And the success for me because I was independent and still not. I think, yeah. Just going back to the whole eggs coming. There was a documentary that came out recently on ITV, The Crossing. And it was one of my good friends that worked on it. And that was the plight of the guys who were on the boat that basically drowned. Uh, I think it's like 21 of them died, the majority of Kurdish. And a whole family basically went out in that dinghy. You have to really understand that the situation must be that extreme and bad that it forces ordinary, non elite, non partisan Kurdish people from this region. When you go to Cameroon, then you go to the former jungle, I know they dismantled the little thing they did. Then you go to even one of the, the Poland Belarus borders you came from. The majority of these people were Kurds from the Iraq and the Kurdish region. Now, probably not everybody in this room, let's face that flight of crossing through such countries or whatever. But you have to understand that those people who build the eggs are people that probably came on those dinghies that cross such journeys as a result of policies that were implemented, or at least the responsibility of it was these two ruling political parties. So not to defend the guys who throw the eggs, definitely not, but just to bring that understanding because we need to understand that again, everybody in our community is guilty of one thing, is that we want solutions to problems without really understanding the history of the problem. And this is one of the reasons that we fall short when it comes to changes. We never look at the small point, we never understand cause and effect <coughs> on things at the scale that we should. So I think it's important, and I agree with you, Kevin, that we, you know, we need to all be diplomatic and something we should be all about. But it's also important to understand the whole generation of Kurds that come on those boats, they're not going to have a bright future. They're traumatized. And now we're we learning about generational trauma and how whatever you go through in that journey is gonna affect the way you, not only live your life, but the way you raise your children and your children's children. And no UK state or private organization will provide solutions to that. America's a good example of that. You know, maybe we go through trauma and we don't really do that. Can I add something, please, before I go? Those people that are demonstrating that the our aid is and stuff, we're very aware, so everyone aware of that. So they tell the people they come in asylum and seek and apply for the asylum here. <coughs> they said to them, it's mostly because I, I met him a lot of people outside this time. They said, when the government, Kurdish government, come to the, in this country, wherever is demonstration from Turkey or Iran or Iraq, just come throw the eggs, wherever throw wherever it is. So taking a picture, came back to the solicitor to say, I cannot go back to the country because this is what happened, this is what I did. 
So we are very aware. So I am really, let me finish it. I'm true. really sorry about these people. Ah, they, the, the people they go to the, the hotel, Same the way. people they don't know what they what they do, except instead to, to say to them, please go to college and try to learn college. Please try to <laughs> be educated. Try to learn the rules in this country. They said, come, because I received myself as a single where people, they single text, please come tomorrow. The mayor of Kurdistan, they come in. They didn't know what they came for. Come, they came from here. Maybe they came from here to get some money to meet some people in Kurdistan. So your family then saw. Why are you just coming without knowing because what's, they know, what's they going on? So many people, they don't know why they came into this on the street. I asked them, why you are here? So do you know it's a good, they said, I don't know, but someone told me, come here, and my friends, they said, they not true. This, is, this is not me. No, people, Kurdistan. Nobody talked to you people. because all of them, they know you, you are close to Vardani. Nobody it's not about the Vardani, it's the reality. Honest, you could nobody, go and search it. You could nobody search it on the problem. The thing is, what you yeah. just said is, they've come and they want me taking money back to the Kurdistan region for our family. I know this message is going to different people, and a lot of people coming tomorrow after tomorrow. These people, they were sending that. That I'm so scary sometimes to say it, like to be free, like this is a reality, you because I'm be. not attacking them. This is a reality. No, but you shouldn't be. But like you said, you said yeah. they come to this country and maybe take money back to the Kurdistan region. No, 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 no we're not just saying Even if they take money back to their country. Where does that money go? Example. Where does that money go? No, that money does not get. Excuse me, I'm just saying about the example. I'm not saying that. Maybe there's a lot of issues. Maybe there's a lot of issues, not just that money wise. The problem but is, the Dr. Kamo yeah. said it as well, sorry, is he said the big people are coming to this country because of the policy that these political parties are implementing. Unfortunately, the problem isn't that they're actually implementing policies, it's that every little political party and every little uh, elite have their own policy for every little region of our, of our city. Within Slemani, there's certain sectors that are run by certain families <laughs> and certain, certain certain people. And if you don't <coughs> ad adhere to their rules and uh, give give them the fines and the taxes, then you're not allowed to do business. Just once again, raise that question of unemployment, which is what we're here for today. Yeah. And, and your point is valid. I, mean, I totally respect that point. And there may well be cases of what you described. <coughs> but why are you? Why the girl said to you is, I can't really ignore how those individuals got here, why they came here, and the root causes of that. That's the main point. That there's a yeah. European refugee crisis, that Syrians that should have been housed were described by the mass media in this country as swarms of refugees that are going to do bad things and we closed our borders and our doors. Those same groups were dominated by. Iraqi Kurds from our region. We are contributing to a global refugee crisis. And the, if you like it or not, it, those political parties are responsible. So, a lot of things we have to do, we have to unite it. And we have for to change the mentality of the people. And people, they have to be more educated here. So, I'm glad that our government now, and the UK government, they have to push more to the people, refugees, wherever they have money or not, the charity they have to fund it to go to the education. Because you could look at the, at the hotels, mostly that's in there, they have nothing to do with that. So this is one thing that the, the government well, has to do. Well, that's more employment in Britain. Yes. Well. Let's not well, get on to that. But I think <laughs> he's coming to eight o'clock. We've got one lady who's been waiting yeah. very patiently in the back. So yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Gersha. And um, uh, I just like to mention that, that there is so many issues, uh, obviously, about uh, uh, employment in the uh, Kurdistan region of Iraq. So there's, uh, uh, <coughs> been, uh, if there is any statistic or you know, research about uh, so many people educating and you know, uh, graduating from universities, there's so many universities, one after another. Uh, they open, there is so, uh, most of them private, there is American uh, uh, universities in all, all the uh, cities of the, the region. So I'm wondering if yeah, those people that they get uh, graduated, uh, how many of them they get employed and how many get, you know, in their own, 
how it, it reacts. So, and in, in the, the effort and education, actually, which it's about uh, low income family, where they, 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 don't, they are not educated, which is not a problem. You know, it's not always have to be the income, it doesn't uh, come uh, through the uh, qualification. So there's people, as we all know, they, they work in, 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 in the uh, city center in, in open markets or bazaar. So those people, they, they have their uh, low income and there's no support in, in the whole region in Iraq system and in, uh, even obviously in Pakistan. So uh, they, there is no benefit, there is no housing, nothing at all. So it's all dependent on other people's. So is there any research? But the question is, is there any, then two <coughs> questions obviously, is there any uh, research or don't know whether it's pointing to probably the problem as he's talking about his research and statistics? I think uh, there's no official, for example, the university here in the UK, you have alumni relations. So if you graduate, they measure what your career trajectory is. And I think every two years after you graduate, they do fresh statistics of how many graduates have entered the job market and are employed. The only university that I know that does that properly and efficiently at the moment is the American University of Iraq State Army. They have a very, very good uh, tracking system. And the majority, I think they, they, they hit like a very high quota, 85%. Are basically employed. And they even have this incredible initiative where they don't just, they actually prepare graduates for a market where there's no government jobs. So they bring in all these kind of tech companies to provide internships. So the majority of their graduates actually start tech startups as well, for example. <coughs> Aside from the government, again, no, there isn't. It would be fascinating to know where all of these graduates in these courses. Where their students end up, we don't have that. And as I said before, Yunami constantly talks about the 300,000. That was stats for maybe three, four years ago. So we have 300,000 uh, university graduates that enter the job market, and high school graduates as well that enter the job market uh, every year, basically. And there's not enough uh, jobs being created and fast enough pace. Uh, and uh, as far as research goes officially, there are some private you know, NGOs or, or uh, outside, even some corporations actually do some good effective research, but it's not consistent enough for up-to-date enough for it to be of use for policy making. Thanks. Over the lives of people like you. Yeah. Well, I, I think, think we're going to have to close there. Um, we have got the room booked till 8, so we don't want those uh, official people coming in and throwing this out. Um, but to say, honestly, the importance of numbers of statistics and encouraging projects and people and being clear when you quote numbers where you got them from. I think that's really come out tonight. Um, also, I'm really glad that mention of different careers, the careers that tend to have needs, and indeed encouraging our young relatives and people that we know to look at uh, non-traditional careers, uh, tech jobs, and indeed be broad and wide in what their passions and their skills are uh, as they build a, a, you know, a more productive post life we recognize it's really, really difficult. And I think, obviously, the tone this evening is quite serious. It's quite a big uh, and attractive uh, issue. Um, so it's not going to go away very quickly, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't work towards it. And each in our own ways, we try to encourage positive movement uh, in that beautiful region. So, so thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.